In the first half, it was a typical representative match. Both sides struggled for combination, and the score seesawed as the teams exchanged basket for basket. The main contest was under the boards, where the battle for rebounds was tough, and where Australia's young and big centre, Ray Borna, showed his growing maturity. Not quite there, Borna's in there though. Good rebound over the top of his defensive player. Borna scored 18 points in the game with 12 rebounds and played a big part in keeping Australia in front of the break, 43 to 41. In the second half, the game livened up and both sides scored some fine baskets. For the Yanks' friend, this is the uh, number 10. Oh, good shot. Steve Beck. Oh yeah. Pack 10 had trouble adapting to the Australian style of play. They were frequently pulled up for travel and holding infringements. The different team styles also gave the Boomers the advantage in the end. The American defence was strong but tight under their own basket, and this gave the Australian sharpshooters, like Nova Castrians Mike Johnson and Ian Davies, plenty of time to score vital points outside the line. With nine minutes to go, the Boomers clung to a 66-63 lead, but then the floodgates opened, with Australia scoring 30 points to pack 10-6 in the remaining time. For Boomers coach Adrian Hurley, it was his first match at the helm, and he was understandably delighted with the result. When you come into these situations, uh, not having trained for 11 weeks, and uh, you know my first game as head coach, uh, you, uh, you hope for a win and you want to play all ten players and I got both so I suppose it's my lucky day really. It was probably a lot closer though than the final score would indicate. Oh yes definitely, you know with 28 points it's nothing like it, it's about a seven point game. Two cars involved in the crash, the Volvo and the Tirana, met with tremendous force, the point of impact occurring on the left-hand front of both vehicles. The driver of the badly damaged Volvo, the vehicle's sole occupant, was freed without trouble, and the driver of the Tirana was able to walk away from the accident. However, his passenger, the young woman, was trapped in her seat. Ambulance, police and fire rescue squads combined to work at freeing the trapped woman, while ambulance officers monitored her condition. She's thought to be suffering from internal injuries. The police accident investigation squad is attempting to determine just how the crash, which sent both vehicles spinning to opposite sides of the roadway, actually happened. left of the contents. Security guards removed a 33-year-old Wiccan man who was trapped inside the top section of the premises. He was taken to Newcastle Police Station and will appear before court on Monday charged with maliciously setting fire to the building. After the spectacular visit of the Kookaburra to Newcastle's harbour, the cream of the city's business and political community gathered at MBN Studio A. As the marketing manager of the Task Force 87 Challenge, David Stobart, explained, the Kookaburra Yacht Club is open to only 110 exclusive members. An admiral's badge costing $30,000 entitles the sponsor to use the Kookaburra and its crew in their advertising, supplies free advertising on MBN, and guarantees the buyer accommodation and VIP viewing in Fremantle during the race. Less expensive sponsorship packages, called the Commodore's Badge and the Captain's Badge, were also offered. The Greater Newcastle Building Society was the first company to buy an Admiral's Badge, which was presented to its chairman, Professor Beryl Nasher. During the function, the Bennett Group of companies committed itself to a Commodore's Badge, and Instant Printing's David Griffin bought a Captain's Badge. 
the sponsorship adds to commitments already made by TAA Airlines, Digital Computers, Sleepmaker Beds and The Seven Network to contribute towards the $11.5 million cost of the defence. David Stobart says the Yacht Club will also increase Newcastle's involvement in the project. The purpose of the Kookaburra Yacht Club is one, to get the people of Newcastle uh, involved in the America's Cup. Um, as Newcastle obviously doesn't have its own America's Cup defender in the water. Um, and the Parry Corporation, which is part of NBN and the Star and uh, Jay's Travel, well, Kookaburra is now as much as part of Newcastle as uh, anywhere in Australia. Exciting sports 20, event, both off and on the field. 40, 40, he's going to go all the way for a touchdown! 98 yards, Tolton Walker! Now a Sydney promoter aims to bring a squad of top-line American college footballers to Australia to play a series of matches. One of the venues for this project is Newcastle's International Sports Centre on October the 13th. According to the organiser, Randall Tudgeon, himself a captain of the Australian Gridiron side, the project will cost $250,000 and seven games will be played in areas around New South Wales. What it does is it brings Australians, Americans, Canadians, New Zealanders all together to exhibit the sport of American football here in Newcastle. Castle for the fans to exactly uh, experience all the thrill and the colour and the spectacle that is American football. Obviously the US is the top place for gridiron in the world. What sort of talent are you bringing out from the States? We're bringing out eight players at, at the moment. We're hopeful to bring out perhaps two more uh, to bring us up to ten. Uh, they're of a uh, all-American standard. They're players who have um, played for Brigham Young University which were the national champions last year in the United States at the college level. And what sort of players are you going to be putting those people up against? Well, hopefully uh, by the end of this week we'll know if we've recruited Les Boyd. Um, we've spoken to a number of other rugby league internationals or ex-internationals and we're hopeful of signing uh, probably eight or ten of those uh, as well as a couple of VFL players. The Maritime Services Board had considered the possibility of such independent organisations for both Newcastle and Port Kembla, but decided that a statewide authority is more cost efficient and allows for coordinated planning of port facilities. However, Mr Brereton said today a new advisory board will be established comprising members of local business and community leaders which will have access to the full board of the MSB. The Minister said this will ensure that Newcastle's interests are represented at the highest possible level. As well, 30 new positions will be created in the Newcastle administration of the MSB to strengthen the areas of engineering and finance. Mr Brereton said this revised structure would include a new business unit with a port business manager, industrial relations manager and marketing officer. The Minister said this would eliminate the previous structural inefficiency where Newcastle decisions were constantly being referred to Sydney as in the case of this news report, when we found no MSB officer in Newcastle able to comment on details or ramifications. An early session seems to confirm reports that they have no clear plan for restoring their slipping position in the world market. Many Arab countries are holding back production in a bid to sustain prices. No strategy has been reached today for halting the decline in oil prices. The OPEC meeting continues tomorrow. The situation looks set to worsen in the Middle East, with America calling on world airline companies to boycott Beirut Airport. 
In retaliation, President Jamal has muted the possible ban of U.S. planes and ships from Arab countries. At this stage, only the British have indicated they will support the U.S. boycott. In America, firefighters received a respite in the weather today with fog and cooler conditions. This is what we've been looking for, is a chance to get in there and take a little more aggressive action on the fire. We pretty well flanked it and uh, spent a significant amount of our effort protecting structures. So far, nine states have been battling a number of fires and officials believe more than 70% of them have been deliberately lit. Some 80,000 hectares of land has been burnt out, including 80 homes in California. Some special sort of Over the past two really years, 150 stage, seriously ill babies uh, have been transported to the neonatal sort of unit at the Mater Hospital in Waratah. Those mercy Sydney, missions were made possible by a humidity some, crib you know, with inbuilt monitors that was installed in an ambulance. The of these, now, due to the uh, increased space in the new Bell Long Ranger Rescue helicopter, a modified version of the portable humidity crib can fit into it. It's the first of its kind in the state, and bioengineers at the Mater have worked on the new crib for the past six months. At a cost of $1,500, it's seen as a valuable and time-saving asset in the task of saving young lives. of the small business centre was marked by a tour of inspection by college staff and the handing over of its keys from the builders, latent contractors to the Director General of TAFE, Directors, Dr Alan and Patterson. Of course, uh, the, the centre of the boasts a modern open there. layout incorporating yeah. seminar rooms, That's lecture theatres, a simulated office and reference room. Yeah. Its opening coincides with the first day of semester and its first occupants belong to a selling and business class. Once the semester is in full swing, the college expects 150 students to use the centre each night. Head teacher, Dr John McCrum, says the building is particularly suited to business, to business studies. studies. Well, this building has been specially designed to be flexible. Uh, all the classrooms are 15-size uh, classrooms, which can be opened out to 30-size classrooms. In fact, on this floor, uh, we can open it out to a 60-size room for K-4 uh, weekend seminars. The handing over of the micro B computer by applied technology today also had special significance. According to Dr McCrum, there is a definite need in Newcastle for more computer study one facilities. Will be a major one. I think small business now in Newcastle are using microcomputers um, a lot and um, a lot of them are looking forward to getting into microcomputing and what we intend to do is be able to bring them here, teach them microcomputing uh, for their small business needs and this uh, hopefully will help them. Newcastle Water Police towed one yacht into the harbour late this afternoon after its crew let off a series of distress flares 11 kilometres out to sea from Nobbies. The catch, the Kalanectus, or beautiful swimmer, and its crew of four men and one woman were sailing from Sydney when rough seas caused them to lose steering and control of the sails. After bringing the vessel into Newcastle Harbour, the police launched Doyle refuel to go out again, this time to assist a stranded 13 metre sloop about 20 kilometres east of Sugarloaf Point near Seal Rocks. Luke was first spotted this morning by an F-18 from Williamtown, which tracked down its radio distress signal. A civilian nomad and RAAF helicopter have since sighted one man on board. Water police expect to reach the sloop about 9 o'clock this evening. Meanwhile, a gale warning is current for coastal waters. Only 10 people turned up to the public meeting at the Adamstown Teachers Centre and one of those was Jeff Towns, the brother of bone marrow transplant boy Ben Towns. If organiser John Britton was discouraged, he didn't show it. 
He plans to raise $32,000 to buy a cell washer for the bone marrow transplant unit at the Prince of Wales Hospital in Sydney. Dr John Ziegler, who is second in charge of the unit, was on hand to explain the function of the machine and lend his support to the project. He agreed to be patron of the foundation. Not surprisingly, the meeting elected Mr Britton the Foundation's chairman. Already, he has received $200 from the Greater Newcastle Building Society and any public donations can be made at any of its branches. Mr Britton was a visitor to Ben Town several times up until the child's death five weeks ago. John, Ben Towns wasn't your son. Why are you doing this? Well, the reason... Um, I met Ben and his family in 1983 and um, I looked after him two Christmases before he passed away and um, you know I sort of take every child that I look after as, as Santa Claus as um, sort of you know a, like one of my own children and when they die it really upsets me um, and that's um, reason for it if I can by doing this if I can save one child in my life well my life will be well spent celebrations, there was still a large number of people on hand to see the light shine. The town clerk, Barry Lewis, had flicked the switch and he was joined by officials of the Newcastle Rugby Union and the City and Suburban Cricket Association. It was these two organisations, along with the Wanderers Rugby Club, that combined to raise half of the $37,000 needed for the lights. The other half was provided by the state government. The lighting was celebrated with a seven-a-side rugby tournament, which may well now become an annual event. The clubs have invested in lights to bring the sports ground up to standard for night cricket and international rugby. If all goes to plan, next year, number two sports ground will be the scene of a nighttime clash between New South Wales country and Italy. The incident occurred at the end of the service attended by more than 10,000 blacks in the township of Dedouza, east of Johannesburg. It was the second mass funeral in as many days for victims of racial violence that has left at least 10 blacks dead. A group of about 60 black South Africans singled out a black man and began beating him. They accused him of being a police informer and shouted, kill him, burn him. Bishop Tutu pushed through the crowd and ordered them to stop the beating. The man was carried to a nearby car and driven away to safety. However, the angry mob did set the man's car alight.